just recently I came across um, a very interesting video about these interesting little devices which are basically Doppler radar movement sensors which you can purchasely, purchase readily from your favorite direct from China export sites and I was surprised that actually there is very little information out there about these units and how they work and therefore I thought I'd give it a shot, uh, try to reverse engineer it and demonstrate the functionality to you. So without further ado, let's dig into the very basic theory behind the sensors. I made up this sketch here and whenever you want to build a radar, especially a Doppler radar which is a very basic uh, version of it, you need two things. Um, first of all, you need an oscillator. This oscillator is creating um, a signal at a rather high frequency, usually in the gigahertz range, and I indicate this here in this lower graph, it's just an overview about the spectrum on a logarithmic scale. So you have basically a carrier around a certain frequency. This ones that I've ordered claim to be um, around 5.8 gigahertz, but to be very honest with you, I, I doubt it. And uh, maybe we can do some measurements later on to see if it's really true. And this signal is sent out using a transmit antenna and is reflected off of a target like this sequence here and the signal is coming back to the uh, receiving antenna and then uh, is the second interesting element here which is called the mixer which converts these two signals uh, from the location in that it's very high frequency range down to what we call the baseband and if we have a static scenario like it is here where the stigma is not moving um, Actually, the frequencies are subtracted. I, I really don't want to get into very much details about these things. But you would end up with a signal that is basically DC. So we have a signal here around 0 Hz. And with that we cannot do a lot about it. Um, but on the other hand, we are interested in a um, movement sensor in the first place. So if our Mr. Stigman here now moves, then something is occurring which is called a Doppler shift so the wave that is going back from the reflected object is actually slightly manipulated uh, in its frequency and when it's now down converted these two frequencies now subtract and we end up with a value that is not zero actually it's in the very low end of the spectrum so it, that would be usually um, in the range of a few hertz maybe up to kilohertz or so depends on the setup, the frequencies used, the speed, the object is moving and so on. Many, many parameters here. But we end up with um, a very usually weak but low frequency signal that is easily to detect and especially easily to distinguish from your static reflections since the static reflections um, all relate to a signal that has a zero frequency so this is DC so we can easily eliminate it by having a high pass in the, in the simplest scenario, just add a blocking ca uh, capacitor and you're good. So how can these tiny, tiny circuits achieve this rather remarkable functionality with only a single active device? And to figure that out, I took some quick pictures of the circuit. If you now have some ideas where this YouTube channel is drawing its inspiration from, so you're probably right. And as you can see here, this is uh, just one of the circuits enlarged and I will just walk you briefly through it. So first of all you have here the voltage regulator which just supplies a stable 5 volt um, supply rail. Then here is a detector circuit which is usually used in passive infrared um, detectors and like the motion sensors and here is all the RF circuitry and actually there are only a few passives involved and here uh, the active device if you play around with the transistor markings uh, I've noted them down uh, for you here from all of the circuits that I have available and I've found out that the best bet for what this is it's actually a bipolar high frequency transistor which is good to around about 8 gigahertz. I purchased the sensor claiming that they are 5.8 gigahertz although 
I, I doubt it to some extent. Um, and now I talk, uh, just give a brief introduction about what you can find here in this RF circuit part. So first of all, you have here uh, just a series resistor, uh, which is I guess they're just only to shunt out um, some RF leakage before leaking into the rest of the circuit. Then you have a blocking capacitor in here. Just over here is a voltage divider, which is biasing the base of the transistor. Here you have an array of capacitors blocking all the RF signal leaking um, into the bias supply. And then you have this piece of line here. You have the collector of the transistor. And then you have this funny looking line here, this meandered line with still uh, wires in them. Uh, just going over here to this, again, blocking capacitors. Again, um, just a voltage divider to bias this circuit. And then there is another blocking capacitor and off we go into the signal detector. If you flip it around, you can see that there is basically um, that the whole backside of the board is just a, a ground plane where we have a window built into that um, where this line is visible through it. And therefore, I have a suspicion that this line um, is also serving as an antenna. Uh, interestingly, these gears which are going through the line actually end up nowhere. So my best bet would be that these vias are there to add some more uh, capacitance per length to this line to play around with the um, characteristic impedance of this part of the circuit. But this is just a bit guessing around. Um, nevertheless, the interesting thing here is if you project uh, this window on the front side of the circuit, you end up with a shape roughly about that. And since somehow the thing has to oscillate, remember from um, the discussion earlier that for a Doppler radar you need an oscillator um, and you need a mixer. So the thing needs to oscillate somehow. So I tried to guess the length of this meandered line and I ended up with an estimate of about 35 millimeters. Um, and since printed circuit lines um, have some what we call capacitive loading and also some inductance kind of built into the line which results in a characteristic impedance and a characteristic propagation speed of signals on these lines, you could um, by guessing this is FA4 circuit material because it's the most common one and it's greenish. Um, you can find out what would be the like electrical length of this line, which means what is the equivalent line length of a line in air instead of on the circuit board and you end up um, with an estimate of about 59 millimeters of line lengths for this resonator antenna kind of circuit line. And in order to be an oscillator, um, if a signal now travels along this line, reaches these blocking capacitors, which means that they are uh, reflecting the signal back again, in order to be an oscillator, one round trip needs to be a full wavelength in order to uh, lead to constructive interfer interference. And therefore, the distance the signal has to travel in order to fulfill this, this phase condition would be 120 millimeters. So from this very rough estimate, um, I'd say that this circuit should oscillate at a frequency of around 2.5 gigahertz and not about uh, 5.8 as claimed uh, from the seller. Then um, there is also an interesting question what this rather broadish line here does which connects the bias rail to the collector of the transistor and what this kind of patch over the ground plane here is good for um, at the base of the transistor. And I tried to draft a very quick schematic of the circuit and I ended up with something like this. Uh, maybe with this here, I have something to compare it to. And as you can see here, 
Here is the transistor. You have a piece of line element which corresponds to this line element here. Um, you have this blocking capacitor array here with the power supply. Then you have the voltage divider at the base. My best bet would be that this patch of copper here is basically a tuning capacitor since for very small capacitance it's often better in RF circuit engineering to use just a patch of copper instead of soldering in um, a device since when you're soldering in you always have some issue with that uh, the way the solder joint uh, is executed has some impact on the on the value you're really getting and stuff like this but I really don't want to get into the details about that and then you have this blocking capacitor here you have the resonator line here and you have here again blocking capacitors um, a voltage divider which does the bias for the transistor and then you have basically here an RC uh, low pass over here you have uh, oh, here it is, yeah. then you have a rather large uh, electrolytic capacitor, a tantalum capacitor and a resistor which is a high pass so this configuration basically results in a, in, in a band pass and then here you have this detector so how can we now get mixer and oscillator functionality from only this little tiny circuit with only one active device and actually there is no really standard circuit configuration I could match it up to um, however this looks very like a transistor in a common base configuration uh, which is typically used in high frequency amplifiers so uh, when you have a resonator attached to this kind of circuit and you get some kind of coupling in between the in and the output um, the thing actually should oscillate and when you have a very close look um, at this window that is kind of like notched out of the um, of the ground plane on the back side you can see that at the very brim of this window there is this short line right next to the resonator so it's actually kind of likely that this thing is kind of serving as a way of coupling the input to the output of uh, the input to the output of this amplifier section and therefore it should also should oscillate however we still have to um, get some mixer functionality out of the circuit and for any kind of mixer that you could build uh, you are interested in some kind of non-linear behavior since you can only get frequent conversion if you have a non-linear element within your circuit and then I found out by probing the circuit that actually um, the bias of this transistor is rather low so the voltage present at the base was just around the volt and the voltage present at the emitter was right around 0 0.4 something volt so that means that we are just right about um, the point where the transistor starts conducting significant current and therefore you are in the a, in a operation domain of the transistor where this, um, this transmission curve of the transistor got some curvature to it and while if you do some kind of like tail approximation or whatever and you just fit into uh, fit a line into that uh, operation point here then the steepness of this line is roughly proportional to some kind of gain that you will get out of this stage and the curvature present at this point gives you an indication of how non-linear it behaves so it may very well be that this resonator not only serves as the resonator driving the circuit but also as an antenna so if now this resonator also radiates a bit of its signal onto a target we need Mr. Stickman again and we get a reflection back and this is again picked up by the resonator then the curvature of the transmission curve of the um, transistor will likely cause some very weak mixing effect so we're expecting very tiny tiny signals however since they are so uh, separate in frequency domain it should be somewhat easy to filter them out by eliminating 
uh, all high frequency components, which is definitely given uh, due to the blocking capacitor sec section. Then, of course, we also need to eliminate um, everything that comes from the static reflections, which is done by just inserting the blocking capacitors. And uh, when we play around with the numbers, we could easily come up with a frequency domain which we expect for a typical um, moving person in a room, uh, which frequency they, uh, they will cause, and therefore um, what would be the best bet to set up the bandpass for. So even though I'm not 100% sure if this circuit is, works out just like that, um, I'm, I'm pretty confident that it does. And um, So here's the circuit now hooked up to a power supply. And as you can see here at the, at the bottom, I've attached a wire directly to this IF trace so that afterwards we can have a look at the oscilloscope what the signal really looks like for a static and for a moving target. But first of all, let's find out at which frequency this thing really oscillates. So therefore, I fire up the power supply and if we now have a look at the spectrum analyzer, we can see right over here a bump that was not there before. Just to prove that, if I turn uh, if I turn off the power supply, signal is now gone. So, to find out where this signal is in the frequency domain, let's put a marker there, and yeah, just right about 254, so just right about Wi-Fi frequency. So. Now I try to get everything in shot and to prove that this thing is in fact really working I'm waving now the metal plate in, in, in front of the sensor and as you can see the oscilloscope trace is just bouncing around slightly but this is now really the IF signal caused by the moving target. If I now stop waving you can see the trace comes down and there is no more AC signal that we can detect.